So yeah, thank you for voting for this session and for coming to it. So my name is Zach Rogoff. Um, like I said, I'm from the United States. And until, until July of this year, I, um, I was the campaigns manager at the Free Software Foundation. Um, also, by the way, I speak some Spanish. So if there's something you don't understand, raise your hand, and I'll try to translate. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about this struggle that I worked on to try to keep digital rights management out of web standards. And I'll talk about what that means and why it's important for privacy and freedom and security online. And then I'll also talk about how we lost and what that might mean going forward. Um, and then if anybody else wants to share issues that they're concerned about, about the future of the free web, about the future of privacy and security on the web, I would love to hear about that and um, sort of combine my thoughts and your thoughts and see if we can think about better ways to do this type of activism in the future. Um, and so this is going to be pretty, uh oh, this will be pretty informal, so feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask a question or say something. Let me just plug in my computer. Does anybody have a marker for the board? Marker, oh yeah, thank you. Okay, so, so for some uh, sort of basic information for the background of this, um, the W3C stands for the World Wide Web Consortium. And that's the organization which was started by this guy, Tim Berners-Lee, um, who looks like, This. Um, so this photo is from the early 90s when he invented the World Wide Web as we know it. Right? It's not quite the same as the internet. The internet was already existing some. The World Wide Web is what you see in your browser. If you already know this, sorry. Just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. So when he invented it, um, he chose to make the standards public and to not require any royalties which was a pretty big deal at the time. It was unusual. Everybody knew there was a lot of money to be made in the internet business, and most people wanted to control the stuff that they created. Um, and so in general, so, so he started this organization, the World Wide Web Consortium, or the W3C. I'll write the acronym out here, too. So the W3C. Um, and the goal of it was to coordinate the development of standards for everybody to be able to use the web. And in general, this organization has been a really positive force for the world. If it didn't exist, we wouldn't have had the explosion of wonderful stuff on the web that we've had in the last, uh, since, since I was born, in the last like, 28 years. Um, and the problem with the W3C was always that uh, companies sometimes wanted to influence it. and Sometimes that's good, because some of the companies are providing wonderful things, but sometimes it's bad. So fast forward to uh, 2013, which is around when this photo was taken. And um, there started to be some conflict within the W3C. And so this photo is taken at the W3C. This is Richard Stallman who used to be my boss at the Free Software Foundation. And he's a longtime champion for users' rights. Um, there's many criticisms of the way he works. Um, some people say he's too extreme. Some people say he doesn't compromise enough. I think that may be true, but the important thing is that he fights really hard for important stuff. He really cares about privacy. And he sort of he invented the term free software a long time ago. So he really is focused on uh, a, liberating us from the idea of intellectual property in a bad way. 
And this is a Harry Halpin who uh, worked at the W3C uh, at the time. And so Harry and uh, Richard are here together protesting uh, stop DRM at the W3C. So DRM is the, it's in red, it's the point of conflict. Um, and so this stands for um, digital rights management. But uh, Richard Stallman, like, won't use this, and he said he says restrictions. So it's digital restrictions management. Um, and that's kind of clever. Um, and so what is it, right? There's many types of DRM, but basically the definition is it's proprietary software that has the goal of preventing you from doing something on your own computer. So the reason that it exists um, primarily is because the media industry right, doesn't want you to be able to copy stuff. This became well known during the whole debate over Napster and file sharing in the early 2000s. Um, and uh, what we believe, what Richard Sohn believes, what I believe is that this is just wrong because even if somebody doesn't want you to copy something, it doesn't give them the right to mess with your computer. And um, if you if you think about why, it's, it's not just an issue of like, oh, I have a right to my own computer because it's my computer because I bought it. It's also that DRM is inherently insecure um, because it has to be a black box to work properly. So for example, the DRM that um, we're dealing with in this fight is DRM on videos. Um, so Netflix and YouTube, for example, um, all videos on Netflix Many videos on YouTube carry this DRM, and it means to play the video, you have to download a package on your computer that your browser will download, or it'll be in your operating system already. And this is a, it's proprietary software that is designed so that it's hard to understand it. It's hard to evaluate whether or not it's secure, and it often is not secure. Um, because if it were easy to understand, it would make it easier for people to crack it and that would make it easy to get the data out, which would make it easy to copy, and Netflix doesn't want that. Um, so um, let's see where to go next. So basically, DRM has existed for a while. People who care about free software, we've always disliked it. It's because of the freedom issue that it controls your computer, the privacy issue, like I mentioned, but there's also many other issues. It's not very good for culture because it makes it hard to remix, because it makes it hard to remove specific audio track or video track and change it somehow. And um, it's also bad for people with disabilities because it also makes it hard to add back in something. So if you want to add subtitles to something or you want to change the colors to make it easier for someone who's colorblind or you want to modify some piece of media in any way, DRM makes it hard to do because the, the file is locked up inside the DRM. Um, and then um, there's more bad stuff about it, which I think maybe I'll come back to later. But the important thing about it is that in addition to that, in the United States and many countries, there are these ridiculous laws that are called anti-circumvention laws. Uh, I don't think they exist in Cuba, which is cool. Um, and basically they make it illegal to try to break open the DRM. So if you, if you are a person, and I, I worked with somebody like this, a person who's blind and they want to be able to access a file and analyze it somehow so that they can uh, write descriptive captions uh, and you, wanna, you need to be able to separate out the audio and the video, um, and you, and you do that, and you break the DRM with some technical tool, if you can hack it, that's illegal. And you could be sued for that, even if all you're trying to do is make it easier for blind people to access a video. Um, so the part where the, the, the conflict comes in is um, at the W3C, uh, Netflix and Google and Apple and Microsoft, <clears throat> you know, organizations with a lot of money, um, went to the W3C in, start, they started doing this in around 2011, 2012, and they said, guys, like, 
the web is great. We love that we're able to distribute our videos through it. But the problem is DRM is too expensive and complicated for us because we're using Flash. Do people remember Flash? Right? Like everybody hates Flash. Like users hate it. The, the only people who like it are the people who make money off of it. Um, and so what they wanted to do was take HTML, right, like this language that the web is written in, and add in a new feature specifically for DRM. And the idea was, OK, well, if we can add this in uh, to HTML, then, then we won't have to use Flash anymore, and uh, it'll be easier for us. The thing is that HTML was always, like I said, Tim Berners-Lee in the beginning. He designed the web to be, to be open and to be easy for anyone to use. And so HTML has always been a totally open standard. Everything is public. Um, if you want to change the standard, then you go through this wonderful process where many different people have a chance to comment on it. And it tries to prioritize. Uh, when, they, when they set these standards, they try to prioritize not just usability or profitability for the companies who use it, but they also try to prioritize it being transparent and free and sort of almost a little bit democratic because they, they try to get opinions from as many places as possible. And then they want, when they add something to the standard, like for example, um, adding like, um, uh, what's a good example? A, a new tag to make it easier to write web pages. Um, uh, then the goal is that afterwards, the web is better for everyone. And they've been doing this for years, like I said, since the early 90s. And people like the organization. Um, but this was the first time it happened in, in around 2012, 2013, that Netflix and those other organizations came and they said, we want to add a standard specifically for DRM. We're going to add it. We're really like big companies who own a lot of intellectual property are really that's who it's for. It's, it's for us to do that. And it's going to allow us to more easily put DRM on people's computers and more easily have them watch videos with DRM. And so immediately, um, these two people especially, but others were like, wait a minute. I thought that the point of the W3C and the point of Tim Berners-Lee's work and the point of HTML and the point of the World Wide Web was that it was for everyone and it was supposed to be open. And why would we add something that was specifically just for restricting you from doing things with videos that was bad for people with disabilities, that was bad for security, uh, even bad for competition in some markets? Um, and um, so we started trying to uh, raise awareness about this. And we thought that if we just explained to Tim Berners-Lee why this was bad, that he would understand. Because you know he cares about freedom and he cares about openness, and that's why we made this. <laughs> um, so we tried this, and we thought like, okay, Tim Berners Lee will see this, and th this, and he'll say, oh, you know, you're right. So Timble is his, his old hacker name that he used when he invented the web. So this is like, and a picture of him from back when he was younger. So it's like, what would Timble do? Like, why did you abandon your ideals? Like, wouldn't don't, don't you want the web to be open still? Um, don't add DRM to it. And so we tried this argument, and the, you know, Richard Stallman and Harry went to the W3C. And um, surprisingly, Tim Berners-Lee didn't really feel the same way about it. Um, he feels like um, Netflix is important to the web, and Netflix wants this this DRM standard added to the web. And so we should probably do it. Because Netflix told him, if you don't do this, we just won't use the web anymore. They're just like people, we'll take Netflix off the web. And we'll, for if you want to watch Netflix, you'll need to download a Netflix application on your computer or your phone or whatever, instead of using a browser. And that scared Tim Berners-Lee, because he wants people to use the web. Um, and so we kept trying to explain to him that people care more about, we hope people care more about, and we care more about openness and freedom and security and accessibility for people with disabilities. But that line of argument didn't really work. Um, and I, I mean, I think it's because, yeah, he, he cares more about satisfying Netflix. And 
I can't promise that he's wrong that, um, no, that's not the right way to say it. I do think he's wrong. Um, I do think he's wrong that if, if, the, if um, he had said no and we had won, that Netflix would still use the web, right? Um, whenever whenever um, people threaten these big companies um, with not getting what they want, the companies make claims like this. They say, like, if you don't, if you don't make this easier for me and you don't make this cheaper for us, then we'll leave and it'll ruin everything. And but if Netflix stopped using the web, who cares? Well, if Netflix stopped using the web, at least Tim Berners-Lee would care. Why? Because he maintains the web, <laughs> or like he, he, yeah, yeah. But so, right, exactly. So that's one thing is like, I don't necessarily, there's a bunch of different arguments about that and I could come back to it in more detail. But like, there is, there is also like a concern about um, beyond Netflix about like, it, like for, it's not just Netflix, right? Cause like you can link to a YouTube video even if it has DRM on it. If YouTube did the same thing, you might not be able to link to it. And being able to link to things on the web is really important. It's like what makes it rich. So in the long term, we might even be bothered by that. But it doesn't even matter because they, they wouldn't stop using the web. <laughs> I really don't think they would do that. They, if you go back in history, there are so many examples where these companies say, you know, like for example, like with the climate change, right? Like the, um, the oil companies say, if you regulate us so that we don't destroy the atmosphere, then like it'll break the entire economy and no one will have jobs. And it's, you know, why they're just going to say that regardless of whether it's true. Um, so basically, yeah, so 2013, this happens. Um, people are starting to get concerned because they thought the W3C was the good guy. Um, we tried to convince Tim Berners-Lee. He wasn't really willing to listen. Instead, he listened to Netflix and Microsoft and Google and Apple. Um, and so we tried other things. We tried a, this is a small photo, but. We tried this calling campaign. This was a joke. Sorry, the, it's grainy, but uh, dial up to save the web from DRM, like a joke on like dial up internet from the early days. And we, hundreds of people called him, um, called Tim Berners-Lee on his, on his phone number at the W3C. Is that his home phone number? N that's his like uh, office phone, but it's like his personal office phone. Uh, only like a small number of people actually had a conversation with him because after the first like five or six, he stopped answering it. Um, but yeah, it says, tell the web's inventor, don't risk our security and rights. Um, and um, so yeah, people from all over the world and people also called uh, other W3C offices because again, like, the W3C is a, a good organization and they have offices all over the world um, so that people can express concerns. And so yeah, hundreds of people called him. Um, and people also, um, see if I can find more, out more of these photos. People also took uh, these selfies and different photos in places like in front of the W3C. These are like some people in Boston. Um, and we got like hundreds of these. And if I had an internet connection, I would show you more. There's like one with a cat. There's like one where a guy is playing a trombone. Um, but basically just like trying to be creative um, to get Tim Berners-Lee's attention, but also just to like make the rest of the world notice. Because we're starting to get scared around like 2015 that like we can't win this. Um, this is just going to be, the web is going to have this embedded in it. Um, and there's going to be more DRM and it's going to be bad for privacy and accessibility and freedom. And so we tried like everything we could think of, and we also built a coalition. So the Electronic Frontier Foundation joined the coalition. That's like a wonderful, well-resourced organization. Um, and they actually joined the W3C. So the same way that the, like Net Netflix has like an official membership in the W3C that lets them influence the standards. And um, so, um, the, the Electronic Frontier Foundation joined the W3C and they sent Cory Doctorow, who's a very accomplished activist, to the W3C to try to explain why this was a bad idea. But like I said, like the, this, this argument, like all these arguments about privacy and accessibility and also this, um, 
it wasn't really enough to convince them not to do it. Um, they felt like, okay, well, we'll build in a couple checks sort of to make it safer somehow or to make it more accessible. But when we told them that fundamentally it's never going to be secure and free if it's not an open, transparent standard that's designed for open, transparent communication, that like, you can't really get around that. It's gonna make it less good. Um, so we kept trying stuff. <clears throat> And the Electronic Frontier Foundation went there. Still didn't work. So we tried having an actual protest at the W3C. Actually, let me show you some more photos first. So here's the, another. This guy is in Prague, I think. He took this photo and sent it in. Um, Uh, no. Yeah. This woman is in Paris. So yeah, we had hundreds of these in addition to the phone calls. This guy's also in Paris. Let me just open up all of these. Sorry, this is janky. Um, Hmm. Oh, here we go. This is the right way to do it. So we tried, after sending all those things and it didn't really work, uh, we tried having an in-person protest. So this was like right in front of the W3C office in Boston, or in Cambridge, sorry, Cambridge, Massachusetts at, uh, at MIT, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, like. That isn't even everybody. It wasn't a huge protest, because <laughs> it's hard to explain this to people. But we had like 80 people. And um, there was some media there. It got in the news. And we just wanted to show that like, we saw that the arguments we were making weren't working. And so we wanted to show that people actually care about this. And um, we showed up with signs and stuff. You know, like This says, W3C, don't sell out. It says like stop DRM. There's like people in anonymous masks, and um, that we thought that maybe that would that would affect them. And they did notice. They kind of got the W3C, like Tim Berners-Lee, and other people got sort of uncomfortable, and they started writing writing blog posts saying like, you don't understand. We're just trying to do this to make the web better. We have everyone's best interest in mind. Um, it won't be that bad. Um, and we were like, okay, like, this, this is not really how this goes down. Like, if you add the DRM to the web, you're not going to be able to get around the accessibility problems. There's going to be security problems, like I already explained to you guys. Um, and so this was like, this was honestly like the, the biggest like salvo we fired because this has never happened before. Like, nobody has ever done a protest in person at the W3C, and no one's ever done a protest in person about like a technical standard like this. Um, so they did notice, but it wasn't enough to convince them. Um, and then, let me see. Um, so yeah, so at this point, we sort of stopped and we were like, we need to explain better why this is bad. Because it's really hard to, like in, in activism, right, you want an idea that's simple and that people remember and share with each other. Like, um, you know, we need healthcare for everyone is a good example, right? Like that's like an idea that's easy to understand, and people hear it and they feel excited and they share it with the person next to them. But if you say Netflix and Google and Apple and Microsoft are going to the World Wide Web Consortium to try to put digital rights management into hypertext markup language, and Richard Stallman, you know, it's just like what are you even talking about? And so we tried to sort of like stop and clean up the argument to make it easier to understand. And that's when we noticed that we need to like really focus more on exactly how it's going to affect people rather than vague ideas like the open web. Because a lot of like technologists like the open web, but, but most people are like, what does that mean? Um, so, <clears throat> so one thing that we tried to nail down is what exactly will go wrong? How do we explain very clearly what's going to be different after this becomes a web standard? Um, if we lose. 
And so we wrote, uh, we put together this white paper, which we used as a basis for some of our messaging. We wrote a bunch of articles about it. Corey Doctorow at the Electronic Frontier Foundation wrote articles about it, and other people did too. And basically what we're saying is, if the W3C officially makes DRM part of the web, it's going to make there be more DRM. That's why these companies want it to be added to the web, because it'll be cheaper for them if they can do it this way instead of using these janky old things like Flash. And um, so it's going to make it's going to cause more DRM on the web, which is going to be bad for, like I said, privacy, accessibility, freedom. Um, but also, it's going to be a huge political loss for all the other struggles against DRM. So I mentioned before, like anti-circumvention laws. So we were trying to, we tried to really like explain why these were going to, the, the bad effects of these would get worse when W3C standardizes DRM. And what is an anti-circumvention law? Like I said earlier, it makes it illegal to do anything to affect DRM, to modify it, to talk about how to break it, to talk about how it works. It makes it illegal in some cases even to find security problems with DRM and talk about them, which is really bad because as we know, like for software to be secure, it has to be inspected. It has to be attacked from different angles by white hat hackers who have to figure out where the problems are so the problems can get fixed. So we said, if, um, if the W3C, which is an influential organization, officially standardizes this, it's going to make it a lot harder for us to say, polit politically, it's going to make it a lot harder for us to end anti-circumvention laws, which we're trying to do. Because when we go to, say, the US government or the Euro European governments or many other governments all over the world that have these laws that make it illegal to try to circumvent DRM, um, when we go to them, uh, they're going to say, well, the W3C said it was OK. Um, you guys lost. Like, people don't take you seriously. Um, so we tried to make that argument um, along with the uh, specific argument that when it's standardized, the DRM will be much more prevalent. We'll have more of it. Um, and um, <clears throat> unfortunately, yeah, that, that <laughs> didn't work either. Um, more and more people became aware of it. Um, and then um, there was this one like good idea that, that the Electronic Frontier Foundation tried, which I was excited about. We're like, like I said, I was kind of noticing, I don't think this is going to work. Um, I think we're probably going to lose. And then the Electronic Frontier Foundation came up with this clever compromise that they brought to the W3C that um, was basically like, OK, add DRM to web standards, but you have to promise the companies like Netflix, Apple, Google, et cetera, they have to promise not to sue anyone or bring legal action against anyone who breaks the DRM for a legitimate purpose, which would be like security research to figure out how the DRM is exposing users to vulnerabilities or um, accessibility, like I talked about captioning or adding, uh, adding a voiceover. So the idea would be like, OK, companies, um, we know that you want this DRM to be easy to use, so we'll let you put it in, but you have to promise not to do like, the worst things with it. It's OK if you want to use it to prevent copying. We wish you wouldn't do that, but we know that it's important to you. Just like don't attack people legally for doing security research using these anti-circumvention laws or attack people for trying to make videos accessible to people with disabilities. And that was a tricky thing because I knew that at the Free Software Foundation, I knew we weren't winning. Um, but also, we didn't really want to compromise. It's like I said before, like I mentioned Richard Stallman, like the attitude, we're very, I'm not there anymore, but they, they are very committed to their ideals and they really want to see a free world for software and they don't want to compromise. Um, so we didn't really like support that compromise idea, but personally, I was very supportive of it because I thought maybe it could actually win. And I didn't think we were going to win. Um, go forward a while, and um, then the compromise was not successful. They voted inside the W3C, so the W3C has like, there's Tim Berners-Lee, he runs it, or he's sort of, he's like the, he's like the, the president kind of. And then there's like all these different companies and some nonprofits in there, and they voted. And it was kind of close. Like there were a bunch of organizations that wanted this idea that, of this compromise. 
um, but it was not enough organizations uh, and people and so it was like, well, that's not going to work. So we went on to the next phase and basically starting to get increasingly desperate. So we tried, um, we sort of, we, we sort of tried making fun of uh, Tim Berners-Lee. I don't, this didn't work either, but I was uncomfortable with this, but it, it was good that we tried it. So this is like a, a joke. This wasn't my idea, but I did make this stupid looking graphic. Um, the, at MIT, there's the MIT Media Lab, right? That's like a famous lab at MIT, and they were giving out this thing called the Disobedience Award that was supposed to be like for people, and th this is in um, late 2016, early 2017, I don't remember exactly. It was called the Disobedience Award that they were giving out that was supposed to be like, um, you're an edgy person who's like breaking the rules in technology and you're making the world better. And so we gave Tim Berners-Lee an obedience award um, to be like, you're just listening to these companies and being obedient to them, even though all the other people who share your values think this is a terrible idea. Um, yeah, but honestly, so it says obedience. I don't know if you can read it. It says, OK, obedience award. Uh, obedience award granted to Tim Berners-Lee for his compliance with wealthy corporations' efforts to add DRM to web standards. People on the internet thought this was really funny. Um, it, people on Reddit liked it a lot. But I think, honestly, at this point, Tim Berners-Lee had just been like, he already decided to ignore everything that was about this, because he was like, I made up my mind. Like, I support the companies making this a web standard. These free software people are going to complain no matter what I do. So this didn't work, but it was funny. Um, and then in. Um, <clears throat> There were more protests. There was a protest in uh, Portugal at a W3C meeting. Um, there was another one. Uh, I can't remember where it was. Uh, doesn't matter. There were protests in other places, too. Uh, there was another one in Cambridge uh, at the W3C. So basically, like we kept trying, even though we knew we were probably going to lose, because we thought that it was important to get people. Oh, that's a picture of me. That's awkward. Um, because we thought that people we thought that at least this way, people would know what was going on with it. Um, and um, then, this is a good photo. This is from the, pro I'm going uh, chronologically backwards, but it's just a good photo. Um, but uh, this guy was having such a good time. Um, and then in, in August, uh, like we lost of uh, this year. So it had been three or four years that we'd been going at this, and they added it. It's now an official part of the web. OK, so we, people wrote a lot of blog posts saying, like, this is really bad. We lost. Um, it's sad, because like, Tim Berners-Lee sold out. The W3C sold out. Um, but the task now is like remind everybody what we said was going to happen if we lost and try to prevent it, try to prevent the bad things, and also see if like, the best case is we're wrong and it's not that big of a deal. You know? So now I've been talking to uh, Cory Doctorow about it and other people on the internet. And it's like, we're trying to figure out how to watch for the bad effects. Because the negative effects of a standard like this are a little bit hard to measure because it's kind of like a diffuse, infra it's a, a diffuse infrastructural thing. So it's like in various different ways, it's just sort of hard to think about and talk about. So now what I'm doing is sort of watching um, to try to see. The, the first thing is we should probably see more DRM on the web over the next few years because it's now cheaper and simpler because there's a standardized way of doing it. Um, and then the other thing is will we see, um, like I mentioned, the political precedent that's set by this. Will we see companies making arguments uh, in other debates about DRM saying, well, the W3C said DRM was OK. Um, and I have not seen that yet, but it's also only been like three months. So we'll be looking out for that, and we'll just have to try to fight them when it happens. Um, there are other promising avenues for fighting DRM. Um, and 
hopefully I'll be, you know, two years from now, I'll be able to look back and write an article about it and say, uh, we were wrong, it was fine, <laughs> nothing bad happened. <laughs> But I do think there's going to be more DRM. I think that it's going to lead to more security problems for people, and it's going to keep making security research harder. It's going to keep making it harder for people with disabilities to access media. And this will be used as a precedent to argue for companies getting more control over the internet in general. Um, so that's the end of the story. Um, and let's see, it's uh, noon right now. I think I'm supposed to go to like 12:15, so um, I think maybe I'll just like talk for like a couple minutes about the uh, the reflections on the strategy that we used to try to win this that, that we failed, um, and then and then pause for questions and people to share any other digital rights, uh, specifically web-related concerns that they have moving forward. So reflecting on this, like why did we lose? Um, I think honestly, like it's just the standard political problem where you have like some activists who care about something on this side who aren't very powerful and then like a bunch of big companies on the other side and like to win that fight what do the activists need the activists need to get many people on their side um, and we weren't able to do that we got like a protest with, like 80 people and we got like a couple hundred people to like call Tim Berners-Lee and like send him pictures of themselves in front of things with signs but that's 80 people and a couple hundred more, let's make, say it makes like a thousand total. That's like nothing compared to the number of, pe number of people who are paying Netflix to watch movies. Um, so I think that fundamentally, my best guess is that like, we focused too much on technical arguments because um, at the W3C in this technical space, those companies are, 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 are gonna win because they have, um, Basically, we, I didn't say that right. It's not that we focus too much on technical arguments, is that we focus too much on the W3C, this, this technical standards body. Um, we thought that we could win there by making good arguments and calling Tim Berners-Lee and being like, Tim, why did you give up your ideals? But in that context, the interests of these companies and the arguments they're able to make about like, we'll leave the web if you don't add DRM, even though that's like not true, those arguments were stronger. So what we should have done, I think, is we should have immediately, after we first started to raise alar the alarm about this and we weren't making progress, should have immediately pivoted outward and tried to build a broad coalition of various groups who could be concerned about this for their own reasons. Um, like we could have done a better job involving groups of people who have uh, disabilities who will be affected by this, right? We found like some security researchers who would talk about it, but we didn't get like a large organization or a large like social movement. Um, we could have done a better job involving security researchers and their community and people who had been affected by security vulnerabilities in the past, like people who had had identity theft happen to them because they had insecure software on their computer. Um, and so <clears throat> the lesson for me is like that when, when you're fighting these companies, um, when they try to do bad things, like you, you can't just fight the fight like on their turf. You need to like bring it to the broader political world. Um, if we had done that, would we have won? I don't know, you know? But next time we'll shoot for that. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, I think we have like, yeah, like 10 more minutes. Um, does anybody have a question or an issue that they're concerned about, about the future of the web that they wanna raise that we can discuss together? Yeah. Do you remember the Mozilla decision about? Yeah. Yep, <clears throat> I should have talked about that actually, yeah. Yeah, well, but, but Mozilla gave up on it. That's, the Mozilla, if Mozilla had stayed on our side, it would have been a lot better. Because so, it, it was Mozilla said, <coughs> Mozilla said, um, so when, when uh, the coalition of bad guys here, like Netflix, Apple, Google, Microsoft, when, they, um, they started saying they would do this. They're like, um, Mozilla, like, you, are, you make a browser. Like, you guys implement the web standards. Um, will you support our DRM project? And Mozilla was like, no, like, we, we make open source software. Like, we hate DRM. Why would we do that? 
And then the companies kind of made like the same argument to Mozilla that they made to the W3C, which was something like, you guys only exist because people use the web. If, um, if, uh, if you don't allow this to happen to web standards, add DRM to web standards, then people will, then we'll take our Netflix off the web, we'll take eventually some of YouTube off the web, and people will just have to download apps, and then they won't use Firefox anymore, which is Mozilla's browser, right? And just like they told Tim Berners-Lee, people won't use the web anymore. And like, it worked, unfortunately. So Mozilla was like, OK, fine. Um, you know, we'll work with you on this. We'll, we'll work on this DRM standard. We'll add it to our stuff. And we'll also stop complaining about it. We'll, like, we're, we'll stop politically making noise to try to, to try to fight it. And that was like a big loss for me, because they could have been a really powerful ally. And so they, they, didn't, they didn't endorse the standard, but they like implemented it. They made their own system for playing DRM video using this standard in Firefox. And I mean, we don't know. It, it, if Mozilla had, had stuck to its principles and not done it, would people have stopped using Firefox because Netflix didn't work quite as well in it? Like, maybe. But I don't think so. I don't think that's why people use Firefox. So yeah. Cool. Okay. So we have to meet right now in the front of the building. Okay, so right now? Yeah. Okay, I guess we're done then. Sorry, there's only one question. If you want to talk to me later, feel free. Thank you so much, everybody.